first of all, just for the record again, thank you. really appreciate you doing this. And uh, um, I want to begin just with the obvious question, and really for the record. When and where were you born and raised, and what sort of a childhood did you have? Well, I was born... <laughs> Jersey City. <laughs> and, uh, that was in 1914. And I spent the first two years of my life in Jersey City. Uh, whereupon my parents moved back to New York. They were New Yorkers who had moved to Jersey City with their family, I mean their brothers and sisters, because there was the misbegotten thought in those days that if you <coughs> left New York, which was a teeming metropolis at the time, it still is, but a little differently constituted, uh, and you got to Jersey, you were, <laughs> you were in beatific suburbs. Well, that wasn't Jersey City. However, <laughs> They all, brothers and sisters, I think there were eight of them, aunts and uncles, uh, and lived in this five-story house. I guess you'd call it a townhouse, but it sounds too fancy for what it really was. And uh, we, uh, it was during uh, 1914 I was born, and I would, we left there in 1916, and... Uh, It may be a little later. Mm -hmm. In any case, around the age of three, we moved back into New York in an attempt to recapture civilization. <laughs> and uh, we lived in New York. Uh, we moved to the Bronx for a year and then moved from there to Brooklyn. And then we lived in various parts of Brooklyn until we sort of settled in the part known as Flatbush. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which gives me pause for thought, because we lived in an area <clears throat> in Flatbush, and there must have been something in the air or the water, in the atmosphere, certainly, because... Uh, not far from us was Arthur Miller going to Coney Island, to the school near Coney Island, mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln High School. And I think actually Arthur was born in Midwood section. I could be wrong about that. I know Woody Allen was, and he went to Midwood High. Uh, I was a snob. <laughs> I decided to go to Boys High, which was actually in the Bedford Stuyvesant section, as it later became known. Uh, boys High was just that, just boys, and I thought it gave me a superior intellectual quality. It didn't, but that's all right, I made a try. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, that I was there, I uh, went to school. I went to high school there, graduated from Boys High in Brooklyn, and uh, I should, for the benefit of the school, say that the f high school with the greatest intelligent quota and the smartest students was a school called Townsend Harris High, and this was an adjunct of City College of New York, CCNY, where you had to be just brilliant to get in. It was a college, as you probably know, with no tuition, but you had to have great marks and maintain them, and it had a wonderful faculty. After Townsend Harris came Boys High in scholastic achievement at that time. Uh, I should make plain that I did not contribute to that standing <laughs> in school. I managed to get through the four years. Its high standing as a school of scholastic achievement 
was achieved by other scholars who went there, <laughs> such as Norman Mailer, Aaron Copeland, and uh, uh, the great science fiction writer, oh, oh the, the greatest uh, that we had in America. Um, Brad? Huh? Ray Brad? Where was well, Ray is, is great, yeah. of yeah. course. He's, called, he's a dear, dear friend, by the way. And I've done a lot of his work on huh? Yeah, on yeah, various yeah. shows, but uh, uh, it, it, it's the most famous guy, uh, Isaac uh, Asimov. Oh. Boys, I. <laughs> we also had Tommy Davis, who led the na uh, the National League in batting uh, percentages for a couple of years. He played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. You were a big baseball guy too, right? You liked. Uh... <laughs> you had to be, <laughs> and I, we were we were passionate. Uh, Absolutely passionate. Uh, I I could regale you a whole reel of your film here. On that. We won't go. <laughs> sure, it, it's too much. This is why, as you look at me now with your camera, I am suffering at what has happened to our Dodgers. Yes, <laughs> and I see no way out. But we won't go into that. <laughs> now, well, uh, uh, so that's where I went to school, and then for, uh, we're still living in Brooklyn. Uh, after I graduated from Boys High, I went to NYU for two years. And it was there, going to school there, uh, that uh, I realized college was not for me. Now, uh, what I've not brought into the picture is the fact is that it must have been in those days, uh, as I say in my book, there was the great success of Jackie Coogan, mm -hmm. of Wesley Barry, and child actors. And uh, somewhere along when I was eight or nine, my mother took me in for elocution lessons, uh, and then dance lessons. And lo and behold, I became stage struck. I was the worst tap dancer you have ever seen. Elocution, I passed. Uh, but uh, everything else, no. <laughs> as a song and dance man, which I attempted to be, <laughs> I was the worst. <laughs> but it gave me a sense of performing, which uh, itched its way through my being. And uh, I uh, knew I wanted to be an actor. May I just interject? One question, which is that growing up, did you go to the movies or the theater? And if you did, were there any actors or productions that really stand out in your memory as being favorites or influences? Went to the movies and the theater all the time. My mother was very much in love with the theater and uh, went to the theater often, always took me and uh, my father too, but he had to work too. So <laughs> we would go to matinees and so forth. Uh, became passionately in love with the theater of that time, the 20s and the 30s in New York, when there was a Broadway. And uh, while much of that theater is laughed upon in the sense of, oh, the books for the musicals were silly, and the uh, the plays were of no importance. The fact remains that you had the greatest stars in the history of our theatre as the stars of those musicals. You had Jolson, you had Cantor, you had uh, the mo most wonderful women, and so forth. Ethel Merman, uh, who came a little later, and or you had our greatest songwriters then. Nothing to compare with it now, even as I speak to you. But you had Gershwin, Berlin, Cole Porter, uh, Harold Arlen, uh, Jerome Kern. Oh, one could go on. <laughs> there were ten years in there that were unbelievable in its creativity and the quality of the music. And even now in the paper today, I read they're going to do another Gershwin show. <laughs> They're taking up some more songs to do them. Um, 
Also, the theatre was different then, in this sense, very important sense. Even though people had less money, particularly in the 30s, there was a depression. But you managed to be able to go to the theatre. Why? Because the cost of the ticket was accessible, so to speak. That is to say, I remember I started as an apprentice with Eva Legallian and the top price, I believe, and I could be proven wrong, but not by much, a dollar and a half. And for a play, it was 220 And I think for a musical, it, it got astronomical at one point to allow, I think, $4.40. Uh, I remember when it was that because I directed a musical on Broadway and I was looking at a dress rehearsal of it or a run through after the second week and I looked at it and I thought would I pay 440 to see this and I said no <laughs> and I knew we were dead <laughs> but at any rate I remember the 440 yes yes so um, I may have digressed a bit but I, it, it, my basic point is theater was so accessible you could go down to Gray's Drug Store, which was on Times Square, uh, where the George M. Cohen Theatre was, it, it really the corner of Times Square and 43rd Street on the east side of the mm -hmm. street. Gray's was uh, a pharmacy, and uh, later on where you would buy makeup. For your Broadway performance. But it had a basement. And in this basement were cut-rate seats. And for 50 cents, you could see the greatest stars if their plays were not doing as well as they might be selling straight across the box office counter. So we were able to be an audience that was part of the theatre. Mm -hmm. We were attracted to the theatre, we went to theatre, we were a theatre town. I don't know how people can pay $137 for a seat now. I don't understand how you get a mass audience out of that. But you got a mass audience out of Broadway in those days mm -hmm. with wonderful stars. I know you, you mentioned who you, that you started as an apprentice with, uh, I'm going to blitz the name, but Eva Legallian, right? And, uh, and then uh, you... I gather you're doing a few other things, and then how, at, at, including the uh, including the um, Federal Theater, and then is it through that that you connected with Orson Welles and John Houseman and this? How, how did the Mercury uh, experience come out of right. that? Uh, in, in the course of uh, finally leaving, Leg I was an apprentice with Legallian, and then left. I mean, I didn't leave, it was a year. And uh, actually her theater closed then, she ran out of money. And had moved uptown to do her production of Alice in Wonderland, <coughs> which was divine, great, and some checkup with Nazimova. But um, from there I got uh, in with a theater company uh, based on The Apprentices, it was called The Apprentice Theater, and we did some plays, uh, particularly up in Boston, and this event led to my getting to know. Uh, in Boston, the Harvard Dramatic Club was doing a play called A Bride for the Unicorn by Dennis Johnston, who was a leading Irish playwright. And he'd written a, a hit on Broadway called The Moon for the Yellow River, which he would wrote in Ireland. And they thought after Sean O'Casey he was going to be the next big thing, but it didn't quite work out. But he was very talented. Mm -hmm. And I did A Bride for the Unicorn in, the, uh, well, at, at Harvard. They elected to do this play, and then they found, they couldn't find anyone to play the lead. It was too difficult. So we were appearing, this apprentice theater, under the leadership of a novel, a, la a woman who later became a novelist, Mae Salton. We were appearing in Boston and they saw me and they asked if I would come over and meet with the director who happened to be a young fellow at 
starting in virtually, called Joe Losey, Joseph Losey. Mm -hmm. And uh, we met, and that was the beginning of my doing four shows in the theater with Joe Losey. As a result of that, Joe got on the WPA, not as a result of that play, but he got on the WPA as a director. On the WPA, uh, he got in with Morris Watson, who had been a, a, a top reporter for the Associated Press. And they got this idea really worked out and suggested to them by Haywood Broom, who was one of the top columnists in America and one of the founders of the American Newspaper Guild. And Broom was stage struck. He had done a review about the Depression called Shoot the Works. And he had the idea, which he cultivated with Joe and Morris Watson, to have a living newspaper that every day would change the news. Well, it didn't work out quite that way, but it did newsworthy topics as subjects. So Joe got on there as a director. Now, it was a relief project, but the executives, the directors and so forth, were allowed to hire 10% of personnel who were not on relief. And that's how I got on. Joe asked me to come on to act in AAA Plaudando, which was about the plight of the farmer. So I did that play and I did two more. Coincidentally, at that time, was Project 891, which was Orson Welles and John Houseman. That's what they were called, 891. And there they did Faustus and Horsey Tat. And the production of The Cradle of Rock, which became history of the audience following them up Broadway, you know all that. So, when they were forbidden from opening Cradle of Rock, John Houseman and Orson decided to form a theatre called The Mercury. At exactly, almost exactly that time, <coughs> I had been, I had uh, sort of drifted away from the project, but they had a musical on the WPA called Sing for Your Supper. And they weren't able to put this thing together, really. So they asked me if I'd come back and play the leads in sketches. Uh, the chief thing that has been remembered from that show is the Ballad for Americans that Earl Robinson wrote, that Paul Robeson made so famous. So, um, I said, yes, I would. And I started to rehearse when, lo and behold, I got an offer from George S. Kaufman, who was the biggest thing on Broadway, from the biggest manager on Broadway, Max Gordon, to come and do a review with them. I think it was called Sing Out the News or something like that. And uh, I said, no, I promised the Federal Theatre I would do the Federal Theatre. Shortly thereafter, Max Gordon is at the track in Laurel, Maryland, when he runs into Harry Hopkins, who is the right-hand man of Frank Lindy Roosevelt. And Gordon says, hey, what are you running there on the WPA? And Hopkins asks him, what is he talking about? He said, uh, you know, we offered uh, an actor on there named Norman Lloyd. We offered him a part in a Broadway show under George S. Me turned us down to stay on the WPA. What have you got going there? And that's when Hopkins said the famous remark. Oh, don't you know, we tax, tax, spend, spend, and elect, elect. <laughs> and um, when he got back to his office, he issued an, an order, fire Norman Lloyd. <laughs> and I was out. Because you were not allowed to turn down a job in private industry at all. Oh, okay, okay. The Bolton. Well, 
<clears throat> what happened was, just about that time, Houseman and Wells were forming the Mercury. And they offered me a job as a, an actor in the Mercury. And it, it consisted of playing in Julius Caesar, the sin of the poet, and uh, ho um, the shoemaker's holiday. Shoe, shoe, shoemaker's holiday. And uh, I did those two shows with him. I have to ask you about that. Uh, first of all, when you first joined Mercury and it was taking off, A, who else was involved? And B, uh, did you realize right away that it was something special? Or did it take, at what point did you realize that it was something special? Who else was involved? You mean who was in the cast? Yeah, and because there was there were stage and radio people, right? And there was sort of a... No. Bit, no? It was just stage people. Okay. The radio company, which also, also had the Mercury Theater of the Air, was a separate company. Okay. Those people were not in the theater company of the original Mercury. There were a couple of overlaps, like George Kalouris, and I think Joe Cotton was an overlap, definitely. Uh, but the basic company, uh, Martin Gable, who was a top, top radio actor, one of the very top, was not an Orson's company, I don't think, in the, on radio, because he was on a program called Big Sister, which was a big commercial show. So he couldn't have been, I don't think. But he was also in the original Mercury, as they say, with Kalouris. For the second show, Shoemaker's Holiday, Vincent Price came to join us, having become an overnight star in Victoria, Regina, uh, playing Prince Albert. And, but he rejected the Broadway thing and wanted to be part of a repertory company. <clears throat> and he came over and he did, uh, he also appeared in Heartbreak House as, yeah. And the other show we did was The Cradle of Rock, which is a story mm -hmm. in itself. So, <clears throat> I, uh, let's see who else you would remember from that company. Well, I'll tell you, I've interviewed two people who were in some capacity involved with Mercury. I don't know how early, but the first is Ruth Warwick, who's died. I guess that might have been later on. She wasn't in the theater company. No, it was the radio side she was in. She may have been the radio. And the know. other one would have been Betty Garrett, who was also radio, I guess, or was she... Betty Garrett? No. Radio? I don't think so. Okay. All right. She was not in the Mercury Theater. I knew Betty very well. My wife knew her very well. Okay. Loved her. Mm -hmm. She was a doll and a beautiful performer. But she was not in the Mercury. I don't know how that, but <clears throat> not in, when I was there. Also, I more, more readily or more easily remember a girl on the switchboard of the telephone. Because in those days, you had a switchboard operator plugged in thing. We had one, Judy Holiday. <laughs> So she she was, I think, fifteen when she got the job. I maybe I could maybe be proved wrong, but I don't think I am. <laughs> That's amazing. I don't think she she joined the Mercury when she was fifteen. Yes. Well, now, um, well, I mentioned Joe Cotton um, and Kalouris, mm -hmm. Gable. Uh, those were the prominent people and myself, yeah. The the big hit from what I, I've, I can only base on what I've read, obviously, but from, from my understanding was uh, the thing that drew attention to Mercury maybe for the first time in a big way was, was the Julius Caesar production. And I want to ask you, what was it about that as a, as a key member of the cast, as someone who witnessed the, the resulting spectacle of, of the, all the... What made that so special? And uh, I guess your own from your own perspective of doing it. Let's go back to your previous question, which that overlaps. Okay. 
your previous question is, when did I realize? Yes. We were, uh, my answer will encompass that. Okay. Olson, who had apparently done Caesar in modern dress when he was 15, I think, at the, uh, the Hill School in Illinois, where he went to prep school. So this always stayed with him, the idea of doing Caesar. Now he and Hausman selected this production, or this play, as their first production. Coincident, uh, uh, to do it in modern dress. Modern dress meaning Italian, meaning fascist, meaning Mussolini, because Mussolini was then in power. So the selection of this play at the time that Mussolini was in power was most fortuitous. And not only that, it made it seem, doing it in modern dress, with the green fascist military uniforms, and Mark Blitzstein, who did the music, uh, took the fascist anthem, the Givenezza, and adapted it to the play and the whole thing. The whole thing was like a political melodrama written last night. The lighting, too, I've read. The lighting, huh? the lighting as well, right? I've read the lighting was uh, sort of for like Nuremberg. Oh, well, that was for the last scene. Okay. I'm jumping yeah. ahead. I'm jumping ahead. Yeah. The Nuremberg <laughs> so, lights, yes. yes. Well, yeah. Uh, therefore, the whole coming together of that production or in concept, let's talk about concept before we talk about execution. But in concept, it had the feeling, as I just said, of a political melodrama that was of the moment. It had, therefore, the immediacy which you so seek in all Shakespeare, your problem, if you want to call it that, aesthetic problem, is to make Shakespeare immediate to an audience, no matter what period you put it in. I mean, I saw Gilgood's Hamlet, which I think is the finest I've seen, in 1937. And it was in the traditional period, the Elizabethan period. However, the way he read that verse made it so immediate that it was as if it was being written at the moment. So that you overcome it by whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. In the case of Olson directing this production, with the cutting of the script, the addition of a little Coriolanus in it, and the lights, the music, the sound, the mise-en-scene, the staging, All these elements at which he was a master, also, he was, uh, combined to give a production of such immediacy for the audience that when it finally came together, it was electrifying. However, before it came together, we had the usual birth pangs. And uh, <laughs> there was this and that, and the lights and that, and the sound and that, and the movement and that, and the performance and that. But I was playing a character called Sin of the Poet. And the part meant a great deal to me in a, a social and political sense. I had a whole sense of this guy in the world, of that world. And we come to the first preview. Now, Orson was so involved with the lighting here, the something there, the this there, these endless rehearsals, 
actor starving while he ate. <laughs> so, what happened? I said to the poet, who the scene starts with his coming up the ramp, but it's along a street, you see, alone, saying how he had been disturbed by a certain dream. Then Olsen stopped the rehearsal at that point, and we never rehearsed the rest of the scene because he wanted to add a whole chant from Coriolanus that went like, come, kill, ho, slam, come, kill, ho. And it had to have a rhythm, and it had to have the, this and the that. And Mark Blitzstein, one of our finest theater composers, sitting there on a drum beating out, boom, 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 boom. I never did the scene. Now we come to the first preview. And a lot of other things can't be worked out. We do the show, first preview. Curtain comes down. Utter silence. Not one pair of hands went that way. Nothing. Zip. They couldn't get a curtain call. Couldn't get a call. And that's a story which I relate in my book. Mm -hmm. The Hank Semba, who was one of the two uh, press agents, little guy, husky, broad, but is about as high as his table. He comes running backstage through the fire door, and Orson and the company is standing, looking at this curtain that has come down, and just standing there staring. It's disaster. And Hank Semba comes back and he says, Jesus, well, we didn't get a call, not a single call. And Orson goes, <laughs> and spits right in his eye. Whereupon Semba rears back and is going to throw a punch that would have floored Orson. I mean, because he was, and he, he grabs Semba. He says, spit in my eye, please, please spit in my eye. <laughs> and Semba Picking his eye, <laughs> and everything calmed down. <laughs> now the show was postponed five days, during which time we rehearsed the sin of the poet scene. And we finally did it, because as I, I may have mentioned, I said to Austin, "We haven't done this scene. I am not going on." And it was not in that first preview. Austin said, "Oh well, if that's the way you feel, okay." He was amiable, <laughs> respect. But I said we never did it. From beginning to end, we did the opening and then come kill those slay. So one of the first things Austin did was throw all that out. And he threw a, a lot of things out, a lot. Cut the play a little more, threw out a couple of more characters and the whole thing. But it has shaken the confidence, you see. What are we going into? Now comes the day of the opening which was, uh, I believe, uh, November 7th, 1937. And so, uh, John and uh, Jack Houseman and Orson decide to do a matinee on the day of the opening. Opening's that night. Now we we rehearsed the show over the five days postponement. We put in everything, and now the Sin of the Poet scene is in. And we do this matinee. And the house explodes. You never heard such applause. Fantastic. And I remember John Garfield was in the audience. He'd wandered over from uh, <laughs> the group theater. And he said, Jesus. So, well, we were sort of shattered, uh, <laughs> happily so. <laughs> but uh, they, uh, when suddenly the, 
one of the top critics in New York, John Mason Brown, comes rushing backstage. And now the company is all standing on the stage, and he comes in, and it was winter, November, he takes off his overcoat, he throws it on the floor, and he starts acting all the parts. This is, I mean, with Brooks Atkinson at the time, uh, I preferred John Mason Brown anyway, but he's, He's at this matinee because he's going on a lecture tour and he wanted to see the show before it opened. So he gets out, he begins to act all the scenes. And I think it was there that I saw Morse Hart. And he said to me, you know, you've made history. We didn't know <laughs> we told us. We made history. What that matinee did was give us the confidence that we had it. I remember talking to Marty Gable. And uh, I said, what do you think? He said, well, based on today, I think we're in. And we had that confidence, particularly after Brown came on stage. And so we sailed through the opening itself. And uh, that's when we knew, only then, that time, that we had what we had. Over the next three, four years, uh, the profile of the theater and of Orson certainly grew, I think, exponentially. And I wanted to ask you how it came to be that uh, his first opportunity to, to go out to Hollywood which sort of was all of your first opportunity. Most of you, I don't know if anyone had ever done anything before, but it seems like most of you, that would have been it. What, with, with Heart of Darkness, can you talk about going out there and then what happened when you got out there, which uh, must have been a roller coaster of emotions for you? Well, uh, I left the Mercury after that season, as did Hiram Sherman who was brilliant in Shoemaker's Holiday, a wonderful performance. And uh, he and Orson had been very, uh, very good friends before the Mercury. Uh, this is all part of your question. And uh, they had a falling out, part of it, because the way Hiram Sherman felt Orson treated Shoemaker's Holiday, Orson sort of wanted to go on to other things. Now, that was the season of 37 and 38. Uh, I decided to leave also, uh, partly because Orson was going to do a production of The Duchess of Malfi. And in it, uh, there were, well, I remember there were 80 actors sitting in the theater one night after a performance of Caesar. No, after a performance of Shoemaker's Holiday. There were 80 actors seated in the Mercury Theater uh, who had been summoned by the management because Olsen was going to have the first reading of the Duchess of Malfi. I remember Orson, I see him, he had come in freshly barbered and shaved and haircut and the whole thing and he had a flower, a gardenia I think he was fingering in his lapel and I remember his line, he said this, is, this production is going to please a few friends and myself. That was an ominous beginning. So. Of the 80 actors there, none of whom was told what they was in or out, eight sat down to do the reading, summoned by Olson. And Hiram Sherman, who had scored an enormous hit in Shoemaker's Holiday and gave a superb performance, and Whitford Kane, who was a well-known actor, and myself, who had scored, if I may say so, we passed over it, but a, a hit, shall we say, in Caesar. 
I meet people now, over 50 years later, who just say, who are, who are still alive, <laughs> who remember that as one of their great theater, that scene. And I, Chubby had three lines, and I had three lines. Chubby was Hiram Sherman, and I had three lines. And I thought to myself, this is not very good. So I left the Mercury. Uh, about a year later, when I went back to see Orson and the gang, when they were doing Danton's death, Orson said, when are you coming back? I said, well, you know, what part? And he was talking about Jack Cade in Henry VI, which he never got around to doing. I don't think it was part of his Five Kings. It may or may not have been. But the Jack Cade part, no one ever played. It was a great part in Henry VI. Now, I then went on to do other plays, like Everywhere I Roam, about Johnny Appleseed, for Mark Connolly. And uh, arrives 1939. That's about a year and a half later. One of the things I did when I left was I was asked to be in a play by the group theatre, which was a great honour because they were the snobs of all time. They had introduced this new thing called The Method. They were a wonderful acting company. They were the best theatre we've ever had. Mm -hmm. They were marvellous. But they were snobs <laughs> about everybody else in the theatre. No one else knew how to do anything. They did it all. <laughs> But some of them were very charming and attractive about it. I adored Stella Adler. I would never recommend anybody to work with her. <laughs> She'd kill them. <laughs> and, and so it goes. And uh, Kluerman, to me, was the central figure of the American theater of his time. And uh, they invited me to Kazan. I had done, in the course of leaving, I had done two plays with Kazan. But previous to that, I had made my debut on Broadway in 1935 in a play called Noah with the best actor I've ever been on the stage with, Pierre Frenet, the French actor, who, if you remember the Renoir film about World War I. Grand Illusion. Huh? What should we talk about? The Grand Illusion? Yes. yes. One of the great films yes. of all time. Oh, yeah. And he plays the lieutenant. <laughs> well, he played Noah in this piece, and he was... It's the best performance I've ever been on stage with. And I had done that play, and I had done two plays. Well, that was before the Mercury. See, that was 1935. Mm -hmm. But... What, what I'm getting at is when I went to the group theater, they then, I, I one of the, no, I did one play with Kazan with a, an off-Broadway company, and then with the group I did a play by Irwin Shaw called Quiet City, which was a flop. But the incidental music to it had been written by Aaron Copeland, and... <clears throat> Copeland took that music and expanded it into a score for orchestra uh, called The Quiet City Suite. Uh, <laughs> it was during rehearsals of that, I told Copeland that I was going to go to the Manhattan School of Music. And he said, what for? I said, well, I, I want to learn the trumpet. He says, you're not going to play my music. <laughs> <laughs> that took care of that. <laughs> because this was about a kid who wanted to be a, right. a big spider pick up, trumpeter. Well, this is all building up to the point you, you're getting. Now, I went away with the group theater after Quiet City. And they were preparing or going to prepare for the fall season. And I was somehow going to be involved in that. I didn't know how. Neither did any of them because 
it all blew up for the group. They never got a play out of that summer. Odette's had a play and uh, he couldn't get it ready in time. And Shaw had a play and he couldn't get it ready in time. So they didn't have a fall season. In the middle of being with them in the country, which was Long Island, Smithtown, Long Island. I get a call from the Mercury through the Columbia Artist Bureau. Was I available to go out to California with Orson and uh, other Mercury players to do a picture? With the group theater, I was getting zero money that summer. Breakfast and room <laughs> and lunch and dinner. <laughs> we were poor actors, but we were happy. Was I? So I left, much to the chagrin. I remember walking with Kazan at some length and he's explaining to me that Harold Thurman was the greatest mind in the theater, I mean, to be in his presence. I, I said, true, true, but uh, I'm being offered $500 a week, and here I have nothing. What do you do? <laughs> so I went. I left, and that quit me with the group. And I think Kazan too, although I, that happened with Kazan with, with Hitchcock later. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, I uh, gathered my wife and we went, came out here. That's when Orson combined the two companies. The theater company, which I mentioned earlier, and then the other people who were uh, Paul Stewart, Aggie Moorhead, Ray Collins and so forth. And he brought these people together into one company. We were out here for six weeks. At pay, we got paid. And my tenants improved noticeably. And <laughs> Kalouris and I would play every day and run up to the office every Thursday and say, where's our check? <laughs> <laughs> and then go back to the courts. We had one reading of The Heart of Darkness, the Joseph Conrad novel, and that was it. The studio said they didn't want to do it. How did you find that out? Did Orson gather everyone? When we were there just about six weeks, we, we, were, under, we were waiting for word, you see. But we saw. Orson gathered the company, both elements, in his office and said, I have to say, that they're not going to do the picture. Now, I'm asking you all, he said, to wait here while I put together another deal. And I mean, thought, at what price? Ask him to wait how long? For how much? What? He said he had one idea called The Smiler with a Knife, which was by... Uh, Nicholas Blake, who was actually C. Day, you knew that, C. Day Lewis. Yes. yes. And uh, later on, when I made a picture with Daniel Day Lewis, I revealed this to him in the dressing room. It was <laughs> it forged a bond. I said, hey, you know, also I produced a thing with Bob Redford, also by Nicholas Blake, called The Seventh Something. And... Uh, that was Nicholas Blake. So I had a great thing with Daniel Day, who's a wonderful guy, by the way, terrific. So anyway, Wait, were there, did he present other? Pro was it only Smile with the Knife that he was thinking of doing, or did he have other? That's the only thing he had in mind at the moment. Now I went back to the hotel and consulted with my wife. He's asking us to stay here on no pay. And we had very little money. The only money we had is the money we'd earned in those six weeks. I, 
get a call from one of the actors. And he's saying, listen, this is ridiculous. He can't ask us to stay here for no money until he makes a deal. Who knows how long that'll be? So what do you think we ought to do, I ask? He says, I mean, you ought to go back to New York. I said, sounds, sounds right, yeah. So I finished the conversation. I discussed this with my wife. And we thought, yeah, without they, we better get back to more comfortable surroundings. New York, at least, we could walk the streets. <laughs> so we pulled up stakes and went back. In retrospect, I suppose I should have gone in and said to Olson, you know, Olson, I can't stay, I gotta go. I didn't, I just left. Not very nice of me in retrospect. If you had stayed, would you have, in, do you think you would have been a part of Citizen Kane? Well, he used everybody in it. So, you, yes. But, but. I would not have done saboteur. And that started a whole different path. Not only started a whole different path, but it was a better part than anything I could have played in Kane. I don't know what I would have ended up with uh, anything. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe what Stewart played, maybe what Sloan played, maybe what somebody else played, Greg Collins, I don't know. I don't know what also, how he was going to cast it. But I was not going to be there. And there was an overlap. And it actually was John Houseman, who was by that time under contract to Selznick. He was vice president in charge of foreign uh, pictures or whatever, uh, something. And no longer involved. Well, no, no with, longer with the Mercury. Yeah. What he had already done. Herman Mankiewicz wrote Citizen Kane. When Herman Mankiewicz was hired to do Citizen Kane, because Herman Mankiewicz was, that's no secret. <laughs> he, he liked a little nip now and then. They sent John Houseman with him to Victorville. And in, do you know this story? No, please. Oh, in Victorville. And this is from John Houseman, you're reckoning. Yeah. John said, Herman Mankiewicz wrote every word in that script. He said, all I did, meaning John, at which he was brilliant, brilliant, because I was on the OWI with him, and he was a great editor. Wow, with that grease pencil, bam, bam. He edited what uh, Herman Mankiewicz was writing. So, as Jack Houseman would say, Herman wrote every word of the script, but it would not have been Citizen Kane without Orson. It needed Orson's doing it, but it needed Mankiewicz's script. He wrote it, and Houseman just edited, but he didn't write any of it. And that's from Houseman, and I believe that story. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Whether I would have been cast in it or what I would have been cast as, I, I don't know. Sure. There are a lot of parts in it. But Houseman then left. And he got this, he became this vice president in charge of uh, international affairs for David O. Selznick. And under, also, he was under contract to Selznick, and also under contract to Selznick at the time was Hitchcock. And a few other people, Greg Peck, Joe Cotton, Dorothy McGuire, Jennifer Jones, and Mel Ferreira. And... Joan Fontaine, maybe. Huh? Joan Fontaine, I guess, I think also, no? Or she was loaned for... Uh, she was on loan now. Yeah. But she was not under personal contract. Okay. They were under personal mm -hmm. contract. That's another story. That's all La Jolla. Sure. That's how La Jolla started. Right. But 
what uh, what happened was that Hitchcock got this story, Saboteur, and he developed it with Joan Harrison and Peter Vettel and Dorothy Parker, who wrote a wonderful scene. In it. If you remember the, the picture, blind man, the blind man yeah. scene. That's the best writing yeah. in the picture. Yeah. And when uh, Hitchcock got around to casting the picture. He asked Houseman one day, and he was very fond of Houseman. He was like, Do you know of a young, unknown actor who could play the part of a saboteur? And Houseman said, Norman Lloyd. And I tested and off and running, yeah. Do you remember what you what scene you tested? It was from a play called Blind Alley, which was a big hit at the time with an actor named Roy Hargrave. Amazing. Um, now that film could just as easily have been titled and your character could just as easily have been labeled terrorist instead of saboteur. It's essentially the... the same thing, except before we thought of terrorism in that way. What I wanted to ask you, though, is the scene about the scene uh, in which we see your character smiling at the sinking ship, which I know there's a, a bit of a fun story behind. Not fun, but it's uh, an interesting story. So can you explain how that scene came to be? It's one of the fun moments of seeing your character. We were shooting. It wasn't in the script. No such thing in the script. And while we were shooting at Universal, yeah, news came in over the radio <laughs> that the Normandy had capsized in its pier. For people it's who birth. don't know, can you say what the Normandy for for people who may not be familiar mm -hmm. with the for people who may not be familiar with the Normandy? Can you explain what that? Oh, yes, the Normandy was the largest passenger ship afloat at that time. It was a luxury ship that had been converted to a transport ship to transport the troops to Europe. So it was now no longer a luxury ship, but a transport ship, and it had capsized in its birth, over onto its side. Immediately everyone thought, sabotage. The Nazis or the whoever got at it and in some way caused it to turn over. Let me tell you right now, because it's the best way to tell the story, it was not sabotage, it had just capsized. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, to Hitchcock, <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> that capsized. Yeah. That was done by saboteurs. So right there and then, when the news came in, I, I, was, I was with Hitch at the time, I was on the set, he ordered over the phone on the stage the Universal Newsreel Department to get footage of that ship lying on its side and then to get what we call plates uh, going down the West Side Highway, because the ship was on the West Side in the Hudson River, going down the West Side Highway, a front angle on me, side angles on both sides, and a back, back plate. So you had plates here, there, there, and you had a close-up of me. And he, no, the, cl the, the close-up of me, he was going to get right then and there. I'll explain that in a moment. Okay. No, just the plate in the back. So you saw the movement of the West Side Highway behind me, and then on the side you saw it. He then, having put this order in, he then orders a mock-up of a taxi, right there, and he had it brought to the set. Now, 
we had to wait a day for those guys to shoot the stuff, develop it and ship it out, all express. Mm -hmm. As soon as it arrived, Hitch put me in the cab mock-up, which he already had prepared. And he said, now, on a cue, just look off and see the boat. Now, I'm just on a stage like this, there's nothing. There's no boat, there's no West Side Highway, there's nothing. But now they run the plates, and on a cue, which he gives me, I look off, and then we go on, and people think this was the greatest moment, and the great look, oh my God, what acting, oh, what acting. I never saw anything, there was nothing there. <laughs> but that made you a bad, bad villain. Oh, what a bad man it made me. But Hitch uh, loved the word montage yes. for cutting. Yes. He, he uh, often used to be interviewed about those things in those days, about montage, what it meant, and he had examples of it. For, for people who may need a reminder, because it's been a while since they saw the film, um, can you describe what happens to your character in that final scene? And more interestingly to people like myself who love to study how these things came to be, how that scene in a pre-CGI age was achieved. There was no special effect uh, uh, of the sort that we now know. There was no Avatar uh, effect. How did you, how did, how did what happens to you, which you'll hopefully tell, how, how did you, that you're happen? You're talking about the fall from the statue. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you're right. Your preface is right. <laughs> Today you would do it boom, 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 and you've got everything that accommodates everything. Those days there wasn't anything. You know, in those days there was not even a crab dolly. Uh, Hitch had made a big contribution to the creation of the Crab Dolly when he was describing to the camera department one day, I want a camera that can go like a crab, he said, this way, that way, this way, that way, that. instead of its rigid lines. He, this was his major contribution in regard to the Crab Dolly. Uh, but he was a master in every aspect of picture making. Mm -hmm. so. um, When I came on the set the first time, uh, I was talking to Hitch, and I didn't know the front end of the camera from the back end. And Hitch was saying, would you like to see the Statue of Liberty scene? I said, but we haven't shot anything. He said, oh. He got an assistant, he said, get me the drawings. And uh, they were brought, and he showed me how he had laid the whole thing out. The only part of that entire sequence was the scene I had with Priscilla Lane in the crown of the statue where I accost her. I am in conflict about picking her up or maybe I gotta go looking to see if they're coming for me, all that. That scene and my walking down the steps when she calls me Fry and it stops me and all that that he blocked as we sh shot without any pre-drawings. But everything else was worked out very carefully because it had to be in order to accommodate what he wanted. Now, because he was a master storyteller, he was just a natural storyteller. He knew right away that that sequence would not add up unless I fell from the statue from a big head close-up without a cut. Now that was the technical problem. Because you could do a uh, fall, cut, and you see me. And as a matter of fact, the first shot of Davy Sharp, who was the stuntman, the statue itself, the hand, which is this much, was exactly the scale of the Statue of Liberty, exact size. 
So when Davy Sharp does the fall, which was my falling, when he's in, he, uh, he uh, when I do the backflip, I always admire that shot when I see it, because <laughs> I couldn't do a backflip like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> It is an amazing... But, but no, Hitch asked me if I, I could do it. I said, yeah, of course. It was nothing. I, you do it. <laughs> and I remember I fell a few feet onto mattresses. And there was, and I remember his name, a grip named Scotty, who prevented me from rolling because it was built up on parallels. It was 16 feet high. So I would have rolled, I would have fallen 16 feet. But Scotty was there and he caught me from rolling. But when you've saw the first shot, and it hits, when I do the backflip and go over, then cuts to an extreme long shot, and you see me falling all the way and catching in the crotch of the thumb and forefinger, that's Davy Sharp. And he did it in one take. No net, nothing. Went through the up, grabbed the statue, and held on. I mean, it was an amazing thing. And by way of an interesting footnote, the... Stuntmen for years had their equivalent of the Oscar, was called the Davy Sharp. Okay. But then they did away with it because they found that on pictures many people did stunts, and it was not quite fair to sing that one. But until that time, they had the Davy Sharp. Maybe. Anyway, now I'm there. Now comes the tricky stuff, the cutting, the integrating, and building to the fall without a cut. So there was built, and I was reading, only reading about it this morning. Robert Boyle yes. was the art director, Emperor, and he designed the show. And he became one of my dearest friends over the years. And at his memorial, I said, the basis of our friendship was that we disagreed totally on how the shot was made. I said, any any friendship that's nourished by a total disagreement has to flourish. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. And so, what it was was this. They laid out a black cloth on the ground. On it, they put a pipe-like affair, about four feet high. On that pipe, they put, according to me, a very saddle-like affair that I could straddle. According to Bob Boyle, it was a chair. I said, Bob, I rode that thing. It was a saddle. He said it was a chair. And that went on for 68 years until he died. And I will say I had the final word at his funeral. <laughs> Oh, he's a beautiful guy, beautiful. So, um, on this contraption, now the black cloth was later going to be a match shot. They were going to paint in the bay and uh, the, uh, the old the Bedloe's Island, it, you looked at it from the crown, you'd see the ground, you'd see figures moving which were drawn in. And, I think the genius of all time for that kind of work was a man named Al Whitlock. Incredible. I think he did that, all that stuff down there. And over me, suspended from the ceiling of the largest stage at Universal, stage 12, suspended was a platform. This platform was square, had a big hole in the center. The camera looked down to that hole at me, seated on this pipe. Camera. The cameraman who did all this was the top, what was known in that time as a trick cameraman. Johnny Fulton, John Fulton. He was stood alone at the top of his profession. And John Fulton supervised his shot. And on 
this platform was room for the camera to look down and an operator. On a cue, the camera went up to the ceiling of the stage. While I did superior balletic <laughs> movements of falling, you see, and the camera's going up. Amazing. It's the reverse, really. That's amazing. And that was ground at different speeds. You know what's interesting is that I remember Hitchcock years later with he, with Vertigo to create that impression. He did something similar where he would be zooming in, but the camera would be pulling out, and it created the Hitch sense of you. And falling was a theme mm -hmm. because it's not only Vertigo, mm -hmm. It's also North by Northwest. North by Northwest. And, and just to that point, just as the last thing I'll ask about Saboteur, I know that Hitchcock said he made one mistake, or he made only two mistakes he felt in his films. One of them was about Sabotage, the movie, before... Yeah, he said, I shouldn't have blown up that little boy. Right, right. <laughs> and for, but what was the second one? Because it was something that he corrected with he, North by Northwest. Because he had the wrong guy in Jeopardy, the <laughs> villain, me. It should have been Bob Cummings in Jeopardy. Then we would have been, we would have been more upset. Yeah. <laughs> and but so, you see, but, but uh, you should know the great Ben Hecht story because he ran the picture saboteur for Ben Hecht. And when the, you know, uh, the suspense builds, it's the seams. One seam at a time going, and the guy, and finally the sleeve, and he goes. Yeah. When the lights came up in the projection room, Heck turned to Hitchcock and said, he should have had a better tailor. <laughs> <laughs> That's great.